forward with the first select board meeting of May. Open the meeting of May 3rd, 2021. Like always, the uh, first thing we have to do is uh, approve the agenda. Is there any changes from anybody? Uh, I do have not a change of the agenda, but something to add into the parking lot kind of for next meeting about um, parking down on Blush Hill down by the boat access. If we could add that, probably we're not ready for a discussion today. Okay. Um, Carly, you keeping track of everybody that's coming on? Okay. So uh, with, with that add on for the future agenda, I'd take a motion to approve the agenda. I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Okay, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, consent agenda items, just the minutes from April 19th meeting and uh, April 26th meeting, a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Okay. Second. All right, any further discussion? All those wish to say aye? Do so. Aye. 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 Chris? Yes. Can we find out who has dialed in 802-798-9289 for the record? Yep. Can you? Confirm yourself, please, there, 802-798-9289. You let us know who you are, please. This is Maroney. There they go. What's that, Maroney? Maroney here. Okay, thanks, Maroney. All right. Um, we're at 7.03 or close to it. Time for public comment, if there is any this time. Caitlin and then Aaron. Thank you, good evening. My name is Caitlin Hollister and this is my daughter. Uh, my name is Susanna. And we live here in Waterbury Village. Um, we are here to say thank you to the Waterbury Recreation Department for the wonderful programs they have offered this year. Two members of our family have been to both Rec Academy and Rec Camp, the Academy on Wednesdays when school is remote and the camp during vacation weeks in February and April. When I asked my kids what they liked most about Rec, Susanna said, Funny counselors and her nine-year-old brother Jacob said dodgeball. School can't do it all. We have needed other community organizations. community organizations to step up during the pandemic. We are. Okay, you want to keep reading? During this very challenge, wait, during this very challenge, challenging year, challenging year, we are especially grateful for what our town has provided at such low cost to fill in the gaps. When schools have been closed, creativity plus energy of Nick Nato. Nato and his team have allowed allowed our kids to have terrific social athletic opportunities and a welcome break from some intense stretches of family, family. time. I wanted to recognize family. You know them here. Them here. Nick, Katie, Dan, and Darian. And Darian. And thank you, the select board and Bill Shepla. Tom Town Ma Manager. Ta Town Manager for supporting these programs, plus for providing an essential service to families this year. Thank you. I hope that came through. Big thanks to Waterbury Rec and to all of you for making it possible. 
Excellent job. Excellent I job. We, I think we have a future select board member in our hands. <laughs> yes. yeah. Excellent job, and thank you all. Thank you very much. It's yeah. nice to hear. Nice to hear from our young people. Yep, and our rec program certainly has been uh, a, a savior for our town during this last rough year. And uh, I know my grandson appreciates it as well. So I, I ditto that comment. <laughs> okay, Erin, you're up next. Thank you. Great reading, Susanna. Um, I'm here as a representative of the Waterbury Area Anti-Racism Coalition and a member of their steering team. And I'm here to read a position statement that we drafted, the steering team drafted with help from the education team and we brought to the greater coalition in our um, monthly April meeting to give feedback on. So this is a, a WARC position statement from um, the coalition. It's regarding the recent select board appointment of Chris Viennes as vice chair. Um, this was emailed to all of the um, select board members and um, and uh, I, we, we were very pleased to have a lot of productive conversations last week with those of you who took us up on the offer. Um, so this is the statement. The Waterbury Area Anti-Racism Coalition, also known as WARC, calls for Chris Viennes to step down or be removed by vote from the position of Waterbury Select Board Vice Chair. Mr. Viennes has made racist public statements on numerous occasions in the last year and has not made sufficient efforts to acknowledge or apologize. Elevating him to chair just a few months after he resigned as chair due to the public pressure related to his racial statement sends a message to our community that the select board does not prioritize anti-racism and equity. In light of comments during the April 19th select board meeting, as well as other correspondences and conversations with board members, WARC is withdrawing our previous request that members respond to specific questions that detailed their thinking behind the decision to appoint Mr. Viennes as vice chair. We continue to encourage transparent decision-making and public accountability, and we acknowledge and appreciate the feedback that we received from the select board. From this point forward, WARC intends to focus on big picture policies and systems with position statements and formal letters as our primary means of formal, formal organizational communication with the Waterbury Select Board. In addition to formal communications, our members look forward to continuing collaborative, uh, uh, co to collaborate and provide community informed perspectives through other means as appropriate or requested. We continue to appreciate that the select board has made a public commitment to anti-racism through actions such as the Black Lives Matter banner and the Declaration of Inclusion. We're encouraged by the future prospect of ongoing equity and anti-racism learning for the select board and town employees. One of WARC's core beliefs is that every person and organization can grow through continuous learning, unlearning, and reflection. While white supremacy is pervasive, is a pervasive system in our country and community, nobody is inherent, inherently or permanently racist or anti-racist. By continuing to do better as individuals while learning together in community, we can be more anti-racist more of the time and transform, transform systems to create a community where every person can be their whole human self in all spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, is there anybody else that wishes to speak to that topic? I do. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Go ahead. I'm the other Aaron, also, yeah. uh, also a member of WARC. And I just wanted to, um, to reiterate that this was coming from the entirety of the work community and our membership. Um, and we certainly understand that everyone has an education path to follow. We're certainly here to help guide and support that. Um, but we share a goal with the select board to create an open, welcoming and supportive community throughout Waterbury. Uh, and I appreciate the select board's time and attention to, to supporting those goals. 
Okay. Anybody else? Sure, I'll speak. Jessica? Who's speaking? Am I speaking? Yep, Jessica, go ahead. Okay. Hey, thank you. Um, well, my name is Jess. Um, I am a voting member of this community. And um, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for the work that you do in this community. Um, it's not lost on me that you all have other very much time consuming obligations outside of also taking care of the business of this town. Um, so I really thank you for what, what you do. Um, I'm here tonight for a couple of reasons. The first is that I'm concerned with your appointment of Chris Vans to a position of leadership on the board when it is not apparent to members of this community that he has made the effort to begin the work on racism Oh, I just got, oh, what the heck here? Hello? Yeah, what happened here? Um, did, did I disappear? No, we just got a screenshot of something here. And I've worked with him, that he is a good person, a hard worker, and a really, and very good at his job. Can we hang on for a second, please? Yeah. I'm gonna get rid of this. Okay. There we I'm go. Sure. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. You good? Yeah. I'm sure that those of you who decided again to put him in a leadership position on the select board have your reasons and they are rooted in what you see as beneficial for this community. However, putting Chris back in the position of leadership on the board is really concerning when he hasn't yet done the work you said he would do around racism. In listening to the April 19th meeting, it is very clear that Chris does not see the problem with his words and actions and does not consider them racist. This does not surprise me, nor does it surprise me that some of you don't understand the impact of, again, putting Chris in a position of leadership on the select board. It doesn't surprise me because though some of us are further along the path than others, most of us don't recognize our own inherent racism, regardless of our best intentions. I've been working on this issue for more than 30 years and I still get it wrong. It's complicated, difficult work. I think it helps understand that being called out and being asked to work on inherent systemic racism does not make you a bad person. In fact, as pointed out by the writer Robin DiAngelo in White Fragility, it is this good bad binary that gets in the way of doing the real work around racism. In other words, if we have this story in our heads that says racists are bad people who wear white hoods, I am a good person who would never wear a white hood. It follows that I cannot be a racist. This is problematic. Good people have inherent racism because it is part of our culture. It is in the air we breathe. It is therefore good people who need to do the work necessary around racism to better themselves and their communities. Being asked to do anti-racism training is not a punishment. It is an opportunity. I work in the healthcare field. When asked to do trainings for my job, I am not insulted because I know that those trainings will make me better at what I do. This, Chris, this community is asking that Chris and the rest of the board undergo training around racism. We're asking you make yourselves better at what you do. And because of the very public comments made specifically by Chris, we are asking that he not be placed in a position of leadership because of the message it sends to this community. Those of you who want Chris to be in a position of leadership are doing so because of the skill set you say he brings to the job. Those of us in the community see this as you completely discounting the importance of addressing racism in a real and truthful way. The second reason I'm here is that I listened to the meeting from April 19th and was pretty taken aback by the statements that Wark and some of the people in the community were bulldozing the select board by bringing this issue to the forefront because of the, select board, the select board is elected to conduct the business of the town and shouldn't be dealing with such issues in a meeting because it had more important things to do. It was also alluded to that the people who spoke up at that meeting and those that are speaking up in the community are being uncivil. I would like to point out that this wouldn't be an issue if, if the select board and members of the select board had not created it. War We lost her there somehow. Her okay. On point and bringing it up for discussion. 
the discussion was uncomfortable. Yes, because discussions around racism are uncomfortable. But uncomfortable does not equate oh uncivil. I'll end with that. Jessica, Thank you. Uh, my turn. Hello? Hello? Yeah, Tom. Can I say something? Sure, go ahead. Um, this is unscripted and I haven't thought this out, but uh, I just wanted to thank the select board for the efforts of the past year in uh, one of the most divisive years that I've known in my 62 years, both uh, nationally and locally, and that's 35 years locally. Um, I think overall, we all feel a bit better about coming out on the other side. And I think we've all learned a lot, not that there's not more to learn, but uh, hopefully everybody can do everything a little bit better. Uh, if we survived the past year and this town came back from the flood, I think you know there's, there's unlimited potential here. Um, there is an event along the same lines that I think, and I, I notified the select board about it, I think I, I asked the select board to just review and research and do some consideration. And that is, there's the sap bucket open coming to Waterbury the first weekend of June. And one of the sponsors is Innova Disc Golf. And Innova Disc Golf has sponsored a disc, uh, professional disc player by the name of Josh Anthon and he wears a white pride tattoo. And if you Google white pride, you'll, uh, there's quite a bit written about it. And there's quite a bit of controversy with Anova uh, supporting him and being one of his sponsors. And I wonder if our town, especially given the work of Wark and uh, the issues, the current issues at hand, I don't, uh, I just question if, if people are aware of this and I, hope that people will enlighten themselves that uh, we have invited Anova to set up their tent while every sale of their collector item special disc um, of Josh Anthon's puts money directly into his bank account. And uh, I just wanted to uh, bring that forward um, and just share that with everyone. Thanks, Tom, for that information. Yeah, you're Appreciate welcome. It. Anybody else like to speak, please? Um, can I can I speak? Sure, go ahead, Maroni. Um, I just want to say that um, Tom mentioned work. Um, I just don't want anybody to use work to push their own agenda of wanting to shut down the golf course. So work's <laughs> role is not to go after Innova. So we're not interested in that. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Anyone else, please? Yes, I would like to, like to speak, please. Okay. Well, you get some feedback there. Um, yeah, let me see if I can fix that. Okay. Alexa. Can My apologies. Hopefully that's better. It is. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I just I wanted to. I've been, I've been reflecting Alexa, a lot hang on, on hang some on just of the second. things that were Alexa. said at the last meeting, and I just um, I wanted to share a couple of thoughts. You know, I've heard. Uh, and by the way, I'm speaking as an individual person. I am not speaking on behalf of work. I'm uh, speaking as Alexa, a water can you, Alexa, can constituent. You hear me? Um, I wanted to echo the things that Jess yeah. said about you know getting stuck on this whole concept of like I'm not a racist. Um, Dr. Kendi, who is the founder of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at American and is the current director Carol. of the Anti-Racist Research at Bo uh, uh, Institute at Boston and just one of the foremost um, subject matter experts, not to mention has his own lived experience around this, says racist and anti-racist are like peelable name tags that are placed and replaced based on what someone is doing or not doing, supporting or expressing in each moment. 
Um, and Ijoma Olu, who I, whose book I recommended to the board at the last um, regular meeting, also talks about this. You've been racist and you have been anti-racist. Yes, you may now be insisting that you don't have a racist bone in your body, but that's simply not true. Um, the racism required to uphold the white supremacy that is woven into every area of our lives, there's no, it's everywhere. There's no way that you can inherit white privilege from birth. Learn racist white supremacist history in school. Consume racist and white supremacist movies and films. Work in a racist and white supremacist workforce and vote for racist and white supremacist governments and not be racist. This does not mean you have hate in your heart. You may intend to treat everyone equally. My hope, my sincere hope, is that we can move past debating whether we are racist or not racist, admit that that is in the air we breathe and instead focus on doing the work, because debating that is one of the many ways that we as white folk um, avoid the real work of actually naming and dismantling racism. Um, and in addition to echo what Jess said is that, uh, you know, accusing folks, uh, the, the folks who are asking for accountability for when racism happens, which by the way is how you dismantle racism, you name it and you ask the, for repair to be done. And the status quo is how you maintain racism. So when folks are accused of being bullies and bulldozing uh, for the simple fact of naming uh, and, and, uh, and asking that the harm be repaired when it's caused, um, that in itself is upholding racism. And that in itself is communicating that you're, that we value our own white comfort over the lives of black and brown people. Thank you for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, unless there's anybody else that hasn't spoken yet. Oh, and yet, I too asked like that to Chris speak. step down as vice chair. <laughs> please, please. That point's been made clear and I'm sure the board will take it under consideration. Um, if there hasn't been anybody else that has spoke yet, I would like to um, chime in now. If not, I think we should move on to uh, select board business and appreciate everybody's comment. Okay, so that's what we'll do. We'll move on to the select board business. And uh, our first agenda item is to welcome back an old friend, uh, Ms. Jane Brown, and talk to her about uh, joining the Recreation Committee. How are you doing tonight, Jane? Jane, you're on mute. Yeah, I think she knows that. It took me a minute to get to the <laughs> button. Um, yes, I'd like to join the Waterbury Recreation Committee. There's an opening. Uh, there's been an opening for a, a few months, I think. Um, I've been attending meetings since November, and I decided that maybe it was time to just jump in. Um, I've been attending meetings because there were some uh, issues that came to light about um, Hope Davy Park, which is just around the corner from me. And so um, it's a discussion about <clears throat> the trails over there and the um, disc golf course and how to balance the use and look at impacts on natural resources, that kind of thing, which I have experience with um, professionally. Um, I think in the big picture, I, I am a big supporter of our town recreation program. When I was on the select board, it was really um, enlightening and encouraging to see how the program grew and became um, uh, better and better managed so that it was actually able to pay for itself in some creative ways to find some revenues and also to serve the town. And I think, I think the programs, uh, I couldn't do a better job than um, your first public speakers tonight. Uh, <laughs> who did such a nice job of commending uh, the program and, and explaining what those experiences um, have meant to kids. And um, I think we have a great community and recreation is, is really such a big part of 
of our community, of living in our community and the quality of life. And I, I think the recreation program um, does a great job and with all the organized recreation. So I'd like to be on the recreation committee to um, help with decision making and stewarding these resources, I guess, to some extent. Uh, I have some background in the past of recreation design and um, some recreation planning, site planning. So I think I have some skills that could be that could be uh, useful. Um, my own daughter, you know, grew up in town and took advantage of town recreation facilities as well. So as a parent uh, and a family member, I'm very aware of them from that level as well. So. I would ask for your support in being uh, on the recreation committee. Thank you, Jane. Any of the other board members have a question for Jane or comment? I have, I have a comment. I've served with uh, Jane on both the conservation commission and the select board. And I think she would be an excellent member of the rec committee. And I think they would be lucky to have her. No questions for you, Jane. I think I know Thank you. you. I think I know you enough. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank Appreciate anybody, it. Anybody else? I see Bill Mentor joined us. Um, mm -hmm. Dad joined. Yeah. You uh, have anything to say, Bill? You still uh, welcome a new rec member? Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Uh, but Happy to welcome a new rec member and uh, just jumped in to observe the process and uh, curious to learn about the process of uh, choosing new rec members. Thank you. Any other board member comments? Well, if not, then uh, it looks like Jane, you'll be stepping into a three year term and uh, April 30th. 2024, and if somebody would like to make a motion to put her in that position, feel free. I make a motion to appoint Jay, Jane Brown to the uh, Recreation Committee. Is that a second, Katie? Okay. Uh, any further discussion? No, nope, seeing none. All those who wish to approve her. Uh, Volunteerism, say aye. 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 Thank you, Jane, for coming forward. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And um, maybe we'll be talking about some issues soon. <laughs> thank you very much. Enjoy the evening. Thanks. Okay, the Rotary Club's up next. Uh, not quite Independent Day fireworks discussion. Uh, that be you, Harry and company? It's, it's myself, Dan McKibben, as president, and Harry Shepard as our fireworks. All right, Dan. Welcome. So, can you hear me okay? Yeah. So the Rotary Club, once again, is hoping to run NQID this year. We recognize how important it is to our community, and this year it can be an element of our return to normal, as well as a um, recognizing the end of the Main Street construction project. Um, we believe to have a normal NQID, it, it minimally needs a, a concert and fireworks. And we've been paying very close attention to the state's guidelines uh, following it, you know, week by week, how they've changed and the roadmap to reopening. We're pretty co confident we can run a safe concert, uh, a safe drive-in uh, fireworks event. And the sticking point for us is the uh, step three limit of 900 unvaccinated persons uh, at the parade. And we've been evaluating our options for that. Uh, we believe other than that limit, we would run the event the same way, whether it's on the current plan date of June 26th or after July 4th, when we go from stage three to stage four, where there's no required attendance cap, but universal guidance is still recommended. So the, the Rotary NQID committee has met and evaluated our options. We uh, considered descoping the event. Uh, we just get, considered postponing the event. Uh, and what we're recommending is moving 
uh, the parade, the, the fireworks, and the concert to July 10th. Now, we are going to keep the event uh, smaller than usual. We're not going to have the, the road races typically runs before it. We're not going to have kids' events. We're not going to uh, promote the event broadly outside of town. We also believe that holding it after July 4th may keep the attendance numbers down, which in this year is, is a desirable thing. So we have drafted a, a safety plan for how to run the parade, how we're going to you know, primarily encourage social distancing. If you pay attention to the state's guidance, it's, you know, the messaging is that it's built upon all we've learned as a state and personal responsibility. And event organizers are not required to dictate where people stand, where they space out, but to allow people enough space to find the distances they're comfortable with. And our parade plan is essentially highly encourage people to spread out along the whole distance of Main Street. And we, you know, we, if people do that, and we discourage crowding, particularly in Park Row and Stowe Street, uh, we can have a very safe event. Yes. The, the reason we're coming to the select board at this point is that the select board and the town have the contract for the fireworks. And in order for us to change the date from, from uh, June 26th to July 10th, we want to get the select board's approval as well as answer any questions or you know, regarding the overall event. We will be coming back to the select board for a specific event permit for this. Harry, is there anything you want to add before we open it up for questions? The only thing I would add, Dan, is, um, and I did have some conversations with Tommy with North Star, uh, and although he he desires to do it on the June 26th date, it's kind of a a warm up event for him and his crews for the Fourth of July uh, weekend, typically the following week. Um, he's understanding and agreeable and uh, they can accommodate uh, the notion of moving it to the July the 10th date. Um, and uh, they're willing to do that if the town is uh, agreeable to it also. So just, just to bring everyone up to speed, um, the town uh, has been paying for the fireworks for almost as long as NQID has existed. Um, and uh, we paid North Star a year ago in, in uh, January. Uh, typically, if we pay by the end of January, they give us, they give us a, a bonus, if you will. So we get 10% more fireworks um, than we would get if we paid after January. I don't know how we measure that 10%, but that's what they say, I believe them. So uh, we typically paid in January every year. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and uh, we paid in 2020 and then um, COVID happened. And I worked with Tommy and uh, DJ at North Star and like many businesses, they were they were kind of taking it on the chin. So they agreed that uh, they asked if if we could just leave the money on deposit with them as opposed to making us pay it back. So we agreed to do that. They had our money since last January of, of 2020. Uh, so we did not have to put it in the budget this year. Um, I have no issue with moving it to the 10th of of July, I think that the uh, likelihood that the state's uh, protocols for COVID will, if anything, be more relaxed after the 1st of July than, or after the 4th of July than they are before. The governor has been consistently stating that he hopes to return to more normal by July 4th. I think the general protocols that Dan talked about will continue for many months beyond uh, July even, but uh, there's no issue from staff's perspective. Uh, it's, uh, it's another 10 days out. Uh, it should ensure that all of the Main Street reconstruction work that's gonna be done this year is done. The only thing that should be left is 
removing of the overhead power lines on that section of Main Street where they're supposed to come down. And that will be happening in dribs and drabs for the next year or so. Um, so in many respects, it will be a little bit easier to have it after the after the fourth. Um, but as Dan said, I asked uh, Dan and Harry to make sure that it was okay with North Star because we have a contract with them that, that says uh, June 26th. And the last that I heard from them was that they preferred the 26th. And as Harry indicated, now they, they seem to be uh, willing, if not eager to go to the 10th of July. So staff has no issue with it. And I'm sure we can take Harry's word that um, at North Star has said this is okay. Comments from the board? Mike? Just a brief comment, and it's more of a generic, it's not kind of almost aimed at this. I know you're probably moving the date from the June date to after July 4th because of, you know, universal guidance kind of kicks in and we don't have, there's no 900 person, you know, limits who folks who are unvaccinated. If we don't have universal, uh, if we're not in universal guidance and we're still in that 900 person, and this is a question I have for almost every large event, how are people gonna determine if if people are vaccinated or not. I know that's the million dollar question throughout Vermont. Do you guys have any plan? Do you want me to answer for the rotary or do you want to answer generally? Well for the for the rotary for this particular mm -hmm. event. I'm curious to see how you how your guys thought because this is kind of perplexing me where, where I don't know if people you know cope you know their vaccination card something on their phone you know who's to say you know you, you look at someone someone shows you a phone with a vaccination card you're not going to double check it with their name so it's just it's just something that it it it's troublesome I think yeah so we we that was the main decision factor for us to get out and to move the event out of phase three because right. we don't want to be in the position of having to check that. We know we can control the number of people coming into Rusty Parker Park if we needed to and, and check IDs. We don't want to be in the position of that, but we know we could control that environment. We could probably control drive-in fireworks at the state office complex, uh, but trying to control Main Street, is, it's, it's impossible. So, I mean, to literally control who's coming and going. And, you know, we tried to model out, you know, by. By June 1st, we're going to be 60% vaccinated, you know, one shot by the end of the month, you know, way more than that, right? So if you, if you try and estimate, you know, you could probably have 3,000 people there and, and hit 900 unvaccinated, it'll be, you know, clear on 900, but we don't want to be in a position of checking that. So, so that's for our rationale. Thanks. Edie? This is like a general question to the board. So if we do have people coming from other towns for like the parade and the um, fireworks, should we put out another broad statement that the town of Waterbury basically expects people to be wearing masks at all times? Like, should we reiterate that somehow? So it's it's known for everybody who's coming, like enjoy it, have fun, like visit our restaurants, but please be safe and wear your mask and whatnot. Should we do something like that? I don't think it would hurt. We haven't uh, did away with our mask mandate as of yet. So I don't see why we wouldn't just, I think it's just an advisable thing. Some people I know get very frustrated about mask wearing, but boy, it just seems to just make some common sense, you know, especially if you're in tight quarters. And you'll have those people that refuse to wear one anyway and Others that don't want to wear one just won't show up at the event. Right. Anything else? Okay. Somebody'd like to make a motion to uh, 
allow the Rotary Club to move the uh, not quite independent day fireworks date from June 26th to July 10th. Happy. So moved. Okay. Second it. Seconded. Hey, Danny. Any further comments? All right. Those who are in favor of improving, approving the motion, please say aye. 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 Oh, are we going to move next year back to our normal date, which is even not that normal? <laughs> Thanks, Dan, uh, for, for coming in front of the board and uh, wish you all the, the success in the world. Uh, I hope it plays out good for you. Thank you, and we're very much looking forward to it. Gary. Okay, uh, next on the agenda. Leaf Keepers Race, October 3rd, 2021. And who would like to kick off that conversation? I think I can. Okay. <laughs> Will Robbins, who's been the race director for the past several years, sent me that packet of information back in January that I sent to you Friday on the race safety rules and routes and the like. And I think it's basically the exact same route it has been for the last few years. So he's just hoping that the board will approve that date of October 3rd. Okay. Sounds like a pretty easy ask. Um, I may like to make a motion to that. To authorize the Leaf Peepers race for October 3rd, 2021. I'll move to authorize the Leaf Peepers race for October 3rd, 2021. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All righty, let's take a vote. Who's in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you, Carla. Oh, schedule a meeting with the Conservation Commission. I think I can do that one too. Uh, Tracy Sweeney, who is a member of the Conservation Commission, emailed me and Bill, I think, back in maybe February and asked that sometime in April or May that the select board meet with the Conservation Commission so that they can do a presentation on their work with um, Shootsville Wildlife Quarter. Maybe like a 15 minute presentation with time for the board to ask questions. I think they're going to do the same with maybe the Planning Commission or the BRB. Any comments from the board? So I guess we should set a date so that I can get the word out to the Conservation Commission. Yeah, okay, you're, you're, oh, you're well placed for that decision, Carla. What's that, Danny? I was just curious if they had proposed dates or if we just, or if you, Carla, you have some. It was pretty general. I, we could put it on the next agenda. I think you should mm -hmm. propose the dates, not them. Right. Make it work I'd for say, you. I'd say the next meeting in May or the first meeting in June. They were hoping for April or May. Well, the only reason I su suggested that it might, you might have a better aim at that, Carla, is I don't know if you have more information or Bill does as to what we got coming up in front of us next couple of meetings. I don't have a one thing so far for May 17th and nothing on the June, the June 7th agenda yeah. at this point. So it's pretty open. So if one of the board members wanna make a date, we'll pencil it in. Well, if they'd hoped for April or May, then I think we can go ahead and honor that and put it on the May 17th agenda. There you go. And I'd be curious to know if they have um, information that they'd want to send to us ahead of time or an agenda. That I might be nice to out. be able to look over. Perfect. I can find that out. Some su suggested topics that they have on their mind would be really helpful. So we can maybe give it some forethought. Mm -hmm. I'll let them know. All right, there's no, mo no motion for that then. And we'll jump down to Bill's worksheet. Um, 
thing on the manager's items is consider a purchase of a loader. Yep. Uh, hang on one second. Um, so I can't remember if I sent the email that Celia sent to me to you. I know I didn't send it just today with the paving stuff, but uh, to refresh your memory, uh, one of our bucket loaders is scheduled to be uh, traded out this year uh, in the um, in for, I mean in the highway vehicle CIP fund. We have $150,000 $150, budgeted for it. Uh, we have looked and uh, uh, got prices from three different dealers. We looked at John Deere, we looked at Volvo, and for the first time in a long time, we looked at Case. Um, the price for the Volvo with the trade is the best price, uh, $115,900, $115, $115,900. That's a uh, uh, price for the new machine of $163,900 and a $48,000 trade-in. Uh, the, the case was a close second, uh, $167,200 for the new machine. And fifty thousand dollar trade in, so that was one seventeen two hundred net. And then the John Deere was one seventy three five hundred, and uh, the trade was forty five thousand, so that was one twenty eight five hundred. Um, I'm going to recommend the Volvo after talking with Celia. We have had Volvos and John Deere in the recent past, um, but I think uh, the price of the Volvo is significantly better than the deer price. Uh, doesn't seem that there's a huge um, difference in the performance of the vehicles. So my recommendation uh, that Bill Woodruff and Celia agreed to was to take the price from the Volvo. So if you have questions, I really can't answer a lot of questions about bucket loaders. I've driven one one time and put up sand one time 35 years ago when I was in Island Pond, so. Hey, Chris, in your business, do you have experience with uh, Volvo equipment? You know, I've looked at Volvo excavators in the past and uh, you know, I know their loaders are, from what I understand, are excellent loaders. Um, I mean, I got a, my triaxle is a Volvo, you know, same family, different, you know, different uh, item, basically. And, um, you know, I, I love my Volvo truck. Um, Volvo is a quality, certainly a quality uh, manufacturer. Um, for whatever reason, I didn't feel that their excavators were quite the same quality as the, as the cat. Um, of course, they're all kind of declining in quality these days um, to some degree. And then the emissions issues are tend to be a lot more troublesome. Um, but you know, that's that's where we're headed. So. I don't have any. I don't have any issues with a Volvo loader. Yeah, we've had good success with our Volvo, and you know we've had uh, the, the deal is fine too. Um, but I think given the price differential, the case is kind of uh, it's unknown there. I mean, Case was a, a brand name that was around in heavy equipment for municipalities big time way back when I first started. But they kind of, uh, I think moved away from the municipal market, at least around here, and they're trying to get back in. But uh, I think that the uh, Bill and Celia feel more comfortable with the, the Volvo since we've had one and uh, have liked it. So it's the cheapest, I think, just based on that, given that there's no definitive reason to take anything that's a higher price, we should go with the Volvo. I'm curious Katie. about, um, oh, sorry, Katie. You're good, you're good, you can go. I was just curious about um, a warranty on the vehicle or the equipment. 
um, and and or service contract and if they differed between the two companies? Yeah, we I don't have um, I don't have that information right in front of me, Danny. Uh, we do always buy these uh, products always come with a with a good warranty. It's part of the um, part of the price that we ask for. Uh, we typically don't pay for service contracts. We we just buy uh, the equipment with the with the factory warranty. Um, we get at least a five year warranty on it. So, um, but service contracts we we typically don't do that. You're getting a five year contract. I'm feeling slighted here. Most well, I can ever get out of them is a year. <laughs> I can check. I mean, you don't have to make the decision right now, but I thought we had a five-year warranty. How does purchase versus lease in equipment like this? What? Purchasing versus leasing equipment. I know more and more company, at least in the commercial world, they go into leasing equipment versus purchase. Well, I think that... We we haven't we haven't leased any any equipment. The village leased a police cruiser one time, one you know several years ago. Um, the lease arrangements I haven't found to be any any less expensive. You you pay for it over time as opposed to all up front, and there's always a little bit of uh, charge in there. Um, we haven't really looked into it a lot, Mike. Um, I was just hearing uh, there's always an expectation I think with leasing that the machine is going to be in a certain condition when you when the lease is up and then you have an argument maybe that oh it's it's got too much time on the clock or too much this or that um, it hasn't been difficult for us we haven't really had to you know borrow money to buy these pieces of equipment for a long time now so Owning it's the way that we've gone. Thanks. The, the one advantage to leasing that I know of is that um, you don't have to get voter approval to lease a piece of equipment. The select board can make that decision to do it on its own because you're not buying anything. But uh, I don't think it makes any big sense uh, at, at this point in time. So That's good. I just had to ask the question. Yeah. Edie? Yeah, Danny kind of had my question. I was wondering about what the warranty was and what the projected life expectancy usually is. Uh, the life expectancy, we, we anticipate 15 years for loaders, typically. Well, yeah, Mike, Mike, in lieu of the uh, fact that we, you know, our loaders would typically see more salt than than privately owned loaders would. I think that might have impact on the, the lease issue contract. That's a good point. Uh, where'd he go there? I don't, yeah. Do we need a motion for that, Bill? Uh, what's the warranty on the loader? Talking to Celia real quick. Your point about the service, Danny, uh, Volvo has a pretty good um, service. The, uh, uh, this, excuse me, this, the standard warranty is three years and that price includes an extension for two more. So it's five years. Good. Yeah, Volvo has a pretty good support system when it comes to service. Okay, uh, so do we need to ask if we need a motion, Bill? I would ask you to make a motion, please. And is, is it a 2021 or what is it? <laughs> Well, if that if that doesn't if that doesn't have to be in the motion, twenty one or twenty two, I'm not sure which. I like to make a motion to authorize the town to buy a Volvo motor. 
I make a motion to approve uh, that the town of Waterbury purchase a uh, Volvo loader uh, from town resources. Your second. Okay. okay. Any other discussion, questions? Carol, no. add, uh, add into that for a, a net price not to exceed. Why don't, you, why don't you just say net price not to exceed 117? That will give us leeway if there's any piece of equipment that. We it's have a friend, to buy that's a friendly amendment. Who seconded that? Katie. Second it again just to make sure. Second again. <laughs> All right. Any further discussion? Bill right. has to spend a half day on the loader learning how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right, all those in favor of that, say aye. 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 Okay, the big ticket item, 2021 paving plan. What do we got? Okay, um, I sent you all a memo this afternoon. I apologize, it was just this afternoon. Um, Bill Woodruff has been very busy with the Main Street project uh, and then, um, he wasn't here Friday afternoon. I had, I had asked him last week and he got the information to me today. So did any of you not get the memo? I can share my screen if you want to see it. Yeah, I was in Duxbury and completely out of cell service and yeah, I just didn't have time to even get to it. Apologize. Right, right in front of me. All right, so there it is on the screen, on the screen. Chris. So, um, I'll just take a brief minute to summarize it. We talked about this a little bit at the last meeting. <clears throat> In the paving CIP, um, the, um, the hoped for projects were going to be Stowe Street and North, uh, North Street and Swayze Court, 305,000 for Stowe Street and 100,000 for North Street and Swayze Court. So we budgeted $405,000 this year. Uh, the 405,000, however, was um, hoping to be offset with a grant of 175,000 for the class two paving grant. Right there in the top paragraph, this is what we talked about last week. That Excuse me, Phil. Yeah. Can you unscreen share for a second so that I can let Katie back in? Please need to use her phone. Okay, good to go. Thank you. Sorry. Right. Okay. So um, anyway, we have applied for the paving grant, uh, but we have not heard yet and won't likely hear until late this month at the earliest and maybe not until July about the paving grant. And Bill Woodruff was concerned that uh, given the um, strings that are attached to the paving grant, uh, mostly the fact that we have to uh, competitively bid the project, that uh, schedules of the pavers were getting kind of clogged up and we wouldn't be able to get to Stowe Street until the fall. And uh, he thought it was not such a great idea to be paving Stowe Street while school was in session because you disrupt all the school buses that have to go there. So we talked about that at the last meeting. The board agreed that uh, we'll put that off. The hope is we'll get the $175,000 grant awarded to us this year. We have 30 months to spend that. So if we get the grant, we'll do Stowe Street's project next year. So our fallback, and I wrote about it in my uh, manager's report, and we talked about it at the budget meeting, was that if we didn't do Stowe Street, we would try to do Rush Hill Road. So this next section here in black with yellow is from Woody, and then what I've written in, in blue is kind of my memos about it. So I'll cut to the chase, basically, to the end. Um, my recommendation and Woody's recommendation is that we pay um, Blush Hill from Kimberly Lane, which is right where the class two project ended a couple of years ago, 
We'll reclaim Kim from Kimberly Lane all the way up to uh, Misty Hollow and then go to the end. So we'll reclaim the whole road. Uh, we'll repay from Kimberly Lane to Misty Hollow because we've got that culvert that's in the dip there just beyond Lonesome Trail. That's uh, a big culvert. We're going to need um, a hydraulic study on that, and we won't be able to get that culvert uh, installed this year. There's no way we can do it, uh, even logistically. Never mind, we, we didn't budget for it. So reclaim all of Blush Hill and then repave it from Kimberly Lane to Misty Hollow, which means we'll leave Blush Hill gravel from Misty Hollow to where the gravel ends now and have a gravel road for another year. And then we would uh, repave Lonesome Trail, the, um, the paved part. And then we would also pave the 1,250 feet of Lonesome Trail that is now uh, not paved. So if we do all that, but here's the cost summary for all of what I just talked about. $225,000 to do the reclamation on Blush Hill and pave from Kimberly Lane to Misty Hollow. Um, 10,600 would, would do the reclamation part from, um, from Misty Hollow to the end of the pavement. So that together would be about 235 or so. And then paving Lonesome Trail, which we won't reclaim, we'll just put a one and a half inch of top course on what's there, and probably shim it as well. That's 22,150. And then to uh, do the work to shape up the, the gravel portion of the road and then uh, replace the culvert and do some ditch work and then put uh, four inches of asphalt in two lifts on on that area on that uh, gravel road so if we do that um we're going to up here in this where i've got the red uh so this is what i just added up there is three hundred and twenty five thousand dollars and on its face that's uh eighty thousand dollars less than the 405 we budgeted so from a budget standpoint, from a spending stand, standpoint, we, we can do it. Um, but as I mentioned, the, the budget that we put together included a $175,000 grant. So we were anticipating that our revenue going into the paving fund would exceed our expenses by $42,150. But if we do this, $325,000 worth of work, and we don't have a grant to help pay for any of it, we'll really have a, a deficit of this year for $52,855. And the difference, we've got to add the $42,145 to that. So it's a, it's a $95,000 swing against the fund balance. Now, Normally, I would be concerned about that. Um, we have a small deficit right now going into the year in Fund 70, the paving fund. Uh, the deficit going into the year was $232,000. And if we did as budgeted, we would actually have a $42,000 um, one year uh, revenue in excess of expenses, so our deficit would drop to 160,000. We'll still have a deficit that will be in the $200,000 range after this year if we do that. But personally, I'm not concerned about it for two reasons. One, um, as I've told you many times before, we have uh, five or six. Uh, capital funds, if you include the highway, I mean, the uh, fire station garage, the fire station CIP, we have six. Um, and some of them are 
underwater and some of them were above water and we kind of budget it so we show them all what we're doing but we kind of use it as one fund so this will not put us in a significant deficit situation at all secondly we're going to i hope get the paid in grant next year so next year's budget will uh all things being equal be able to you know wash this year's deficit away and then the third thing the third reason i don't worry about it too much is that um you know it looks pretty likely that there will be money coming to the town from the american recovery act and specifically money that we're being asked to use for infrastructure projects so i think we will be able to actually at the end of the year uh maybe sort out this deficit with some of that american recovery act money and then the last thing is that I mentioned in here somewhere, and I can't remember where it is. Here it is. Um, we were very conservative with our estimate of pilot payment this year. Uh, we only have $20,000 being shown going into our budget from pilot into the paid in CIP. We don't have any information right now to suggest that it's going to be more than $20,000, but we made a big step to be very conservative on the budgeting side and if we are lucky we'll get more more pilot money than we budgeted because we were such conservative so conservative on the budget uh, that i don't think we can get less than than we've budgeted and and there's some likelihood that it will be a little bit more so for all those reasons i would I would do what I suggested, uh, do the whole reclamation of Blush Hill, uh, repave Blush Hill from Kimberly Lane to Misty Hollow, repave uh, all of the paved portion of Lonesome Trail, and then cave the unpaved portion of Lonesome Trail. Now, one thing on that before I close, we're not in the habit any longer of paving gravel roads. There are people who ask all the time, can't you pave, you know, Perry Hill? Can't you pave Ripley Road? Can't you pave more on uh, Shaw Mansion? We've typically not done any paving of, uh, of gravel roads since we paved the hill on Blush Hill uh, probably 20 years ago now, um, the second hill on Blush Hill up, up to the top near where um, Norma McLeod lives. We stopped just short of the McLeod house. Um, I think it makes sense to pave this portion of uh, gravel road. It's 1,260 feet. It's, uh, it's on a hill. The, it's a difficult place to keep graded up properly. Uh, it's very prone to washouts. Uh, it's hard to keep the, the washboards out of that road. There's a lot more traffic going up there than there, than there was when I first moved here because Pinnacle Ridge has pretty much been built out. Um, not having to send the grader up there, um, it would be helpful. It's not that the grader won't have to go up Blush Hill because you've got to grade the backside of Blush Hill anyway. So the grader would be going up Blush Hill but not having to grade that portion would be helpful. And frankly, the $66,000 that it costs to pave it, if we have one significant washout, we'll save that $66,000 the first time. So uh, with that long explanation, I'll stop talking. Bill, I'm curious what, um if you have any a finger on the pulse of like the chances that grant would not come through? Well, um, there's no guarantee that we're gonna get the grant, Danny. Um, we, we can apply every year. Um, the town has received a lot of uh, uh, state transportation funds over the past 10 years since, since um, Irene. Uh, you know, we did the roundabout, um, 
the state did a lot of projects in Waterbury, the, the bridges on the interstate, the Route 2 project, the uh, Route 100 project to Stowe. Now, you know, they're, they're investing huge amounts into the Main Street reconstruction project. So there's no guarantee that we'll get it. Um, I know the district administrator talked to Bill Woodruff and told Bill that there was a better likelihood that we would be getting a paving grant than there would be that we're getting that we would get a bridge grant. Uh, there's no guarantee that we can get that. Uh, if we don't get it, I would I would recommend you know we'll apply again next year if we don't get it this year. And uh, I'm not sure we would put off Stowe Street another year if we if we don't get the grant this year. I think comes a point that you have to pave the road just because of the condition the road is in and not wanting to let it really unravel on you. Uh, we have a number of class two roads that uh, if we don't get the grant for Stowe Street uh, this year or next <coughs> that we could use the grant on you know, uh, Guptill Road or Union Street, uh, Winooski Street, they're all class two roads. So there's, there's always a cycle. Uh, once you get the grant, it's usually, you know, eight to 10 years before you're gonna get another class two grant. So, but the deficit, I'm, I'm really not too worried about that. I know $55,000, I'm not trying to minimize a $55,000 deficit, um, but that that is something that um, is not an unusual amount. And as I said, we we went into this year with a with a $232,000 deficit in the paving fund. Um, if we had done Stowe Street and received the grant, we would have dropped that deficit down to 160,000. Even if we have this deficit now, um, we're, we're not gonna be any worse off than we were going into this year. So uh, I think it's a status quo at worst. Uh, is everybody satisfied with the screenshot? Don't I'm need any more information off there, huh? I'm fine with the proposal. As a matter of fact, I wish we, if we could know more about how much we're gonna get from ARPA and pilot money, I would love to put more money into, into paving, but we don't, those things are all gonna be crap shoots and we yeah, just well, I, don't know. I, think, I don't disagree with you, Mike, um, but I think that money is gonna come basically to us late enough in the year that we're not gonna be able to. Right. To make a lot of plans for it this year. I'm hopeful that we'll get a significant share of that money sometime in 2021 and we'll be able to, uh, you know, just bake it into our budget process and we can talk then about whether it's paving or, you know, we have some bridges that, that we need to address as well. But uh, I don't think we're going to get that money early enough this year to really make a uh, uh, we, we, we can't make a plan for it right now. If the money comes and while the pavers are here, if we decide, hey, we can do another road or two, I mean, there's, Bill Woodruff has a whole list of places we can put pavement if we need to. So I'm not worried about finding a place for it if we get the money. Thanks. That, that's a fact. Um, Jane has a question. Okay. Jane? Yeah, um, I know two years ago it was mentioned to do um, Howard Avenue. Um, and you've done a beautiful job on Maple Street and Hollow Road. So I would just say um, I'd love to see in the next go around, maybe next year. Howard Avenue. That's all. I know it's a challenge. <laughs> you need twice as much money for paving. Uh, you know full well, Jane. Well, I do. We, that. we did have Howard Ave scheduled last year, Jane, but um, 
Duffel Road in the vicinity of the post office gets a whole lot more traffic and the road really deteriorated in a year or so. So when we were up doing the Maple Street project, we decided that we would, we would put the excess on that portion of Duffel Road um, over toward the post office. We haven't forgotten uh, Hollow Road though, but um, I'm, I, Given the logistics of moving the pavers around and things like that, we try yeah. to stick to places that are close by. So right. we, we, okay. won't, we won't forget it. We, we know that it's there and it's uh, a need. It's not improving. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? Dana Allen has his hand up. Okay. Go ahead, Dana. Yeah, thanks for uh, recognizing me. Um, just real quick, Bill, I know we've had this conversation in the past about Stowe Street, and I know that you guys are working on it, and the grant is out of your control. Um, but if the paving, which dictates the restriping, which has a lot to do with the speed and the safety on Stowe Street, et cetera, et cetera, um, isn't going to happen this year, I guess I'd like to reach out to you and Woody and just talk about maybe some options that we can work on together to improve that situation in the meantime, because um, it's not getting better. Um, and I know you guys, your hands are tied with the VTrans plans on this, but I feel like maybe we could figure out some solutions. So I'd just like to put that out there. Um, appreciate your work on this and I'll, I'll probably reach out to you at some point in the future and yeah. uh, see what we can do. Yeah, Bill and I will be happy to meet with you sometime, Dana. It, it's very frustrating that, you know, we don't have to rehash the whole thing, but you know, I signed that agreement with VTrans a number of years ago now, and, um, and I haven't done anything, and there's no real good explanation for it, from in my opinion. Um, you know, when Stow Street gets done, that is certainly in the you know on our checklist to make sure that they do whatever they were going to do before. But um, sometime here in the next week or so, just reach out to me and I'll, I'll work out a time that you and Bill and I can get together and talk. That sounds great. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Bill. Sure. So do you want to put that to bed with a motion, Bill, to accept the 2021 plan, paving plan as presented? Yeah, that would, that would be good. And uh, I just want to make sure everybody understands that there'll be a portion of uh, Blush Hill that is going to revert to gravel for a year. Um, and, you know, it's the same, and I put it in the memo, the reason why we'd like to reclaim it now is just because the reclaimer is going to go up there um, and reclaim that road. Um, and if we don't do that end of the road next this year, then we'd have to send it up there next year. And there's just if we're not in the neighborhood, it's an additional cost and an inconvenience to the to the company that has them. Um, Woody believes that it would be best for that road that if we just let it all stay gravel and run on it for a year, especially where the you know the culvert is going to be done, we won't have the ability to run on that. If we get too much noise about it, we can always decide to pave that portion instead of the gravel portion of, uh, of um, you know, there were scenarios in my memo that said we could skip this or that, but from my perspective, leaving that short stretch gravel for a year won't really hurt. And in many respects, just like it was on Little River Road, uh, the gravel surface will probably be better than, the, than what's there now in pavement. In, in some of that section, that's for sure. Yeah, that's what I was definitely, I was just gonna say that if anything is gonna be a definite improvement over what's there now. So I think you'll be elated to uh, at least know that it's on, on the list of being done. Okay. Let me wanna make a motion. I will give it a go. Um, do I just need to uh, move to approve Bill's pavement plan 1A? Is that what we're calling? Yeah. 
as, as percent as, as prevent of the manager's recommendation for paving as described in 1a for 2021 as well so moved okay second second 80. no further questions all those in favor say aye aye aye, aye. Okay, last thing on the agenda, discuss equity training. Okay, um, yeah, this is something as you know, from the beginning of the meeting and from past meetings, we've, we've talked about quite a bit. And at the last meeting, um, uh, folks at that meeting had indicated that maybe we would work with a um, organization out of uh, Brattleboro and Moroni Minter was good enough to send me some information along. I had tried the week before to uh, call that um, organization and was not able to reach anyone. So, um, I emailed Mary Gannon, or Gannon, I, I think it is, uh, last week on Thursday, asking her to provide some information. And I copied Danny and Moroni on that email, I believe. I know I copied, yeah, Moroni and Danny on that. Um, I hadn't heard anything by late this afternoon, so I sent another email because I didn't have a phone number. And uh, I'm happy to report that just before the meeting started tonight, I opened my email and I received an email from Mary. So she apologized for uh, the delay in responding to me. Um, she has recommended that I have a phone conversation or a Zoom conversation with her to discuss the details and the logistics of this. Uh, she's suggesting that she can talk with me about this on Thursday this week or next Monday. So clearly, you know, she's a busy person as well. So um, I will work this out with her to determine what's going to happen. Um, and on Thursday this week or Monday next, I will get some information from her and then at the next meeting, I hope be able to report back to the board with a proposal of what we might be able to do. So uh, it's, it's a slow process. I wish it was going faster, but um, I can't respond any quicker than she gets back to me. And I was away last week myself for the beginning part of the week. So that's where we are. Great. Thanks, Paul. Bill, just an update, are we looking at, I know I've kind of mentioned this a few times, including department heads in this training? Well, that would be my preference, Mike. Um, I don't want to commit to anything until I talk with, with Mary to see what exactly they're doing. But I, I have had uh, members of my staff here state that they're willing to be involved if, if that would be helpful. So. Uh, I think that the select board and myself, and if we can include some department head people, that would be a good idea. So I'll have more information and, you know, maybe I'll be able to get some information from Mary on Thursday and I can send it out in an email to all of you and you can just respond back to me and, you know, maybe, maybe she and I will be able to potentially work out some times that are available and I can send those out to you and maybe try to, you know, get this moving a little bit. Um, it's, it's nothing that has to wait until the next meeting before we schedule anything. The board has already indicated they want to do it. So if I can work out with her uh, a couple of different times that she is available to do it, I'll just put that out and we can just do it rather than wait two weeks to have another meeting about doing this. So I'll try to push it along the best I can. Great. 
are there any range of costs that are going to be incurred? Because I know we're going to have costs involved, and I'm all for spending that. But do you have any clue? I expect I'll find that out on Thursday, Mike. I okay, don't that's yeah. what I thought. Could I say something? Sure, go ahead, Tom. I'm just wondering, um, the state offered a program called Bridges Out of Poverty um, a number of years ago. I'm just wondering if Waterbury could offer some type of interactive Zoom uh, thing for Waterbury residents as well. I'm not saying exactly the same program, but maybe through the library if that people could register for it and, and uh, have some type of uh, the same type of training or a program, you know, educational program. That's all. The library has had some of this already. I think that, frankly, that's probably a, a better platform for kind of general education than, than the select board. This, this training that we're talking about right now, Tom, is is really specifically aimed for the, the, the board and, and uh, employees. Um, but I would recommend that you um, reach out to uh, Ami at the library or Judy Baroni at the library, who's the uh, program director for adults and just talk over with them what things you might be interested in. They're, they're always looking for programs to to offer, I suspect that if it's something they find compelling, they'd be happy to do it. Yeah, great. That's a great uh, piece of advice. Thank you. I think it's a great idea. Thank you, Bill. Um, obviously, for me, I wish we could have this seminar, whatever you like to call it, in, in person as opposed to Zoom. Uh, yeah, well, we can talk. We can talk about that as well. I'll I'll talk about that with her. Um, you know, I'm. I don't know what their what their service model is. Um, she's out of Brattleboro, so obviously, if we do it in person, there's travel time that gets added. But uh, I'll I'll try to find out what what's available, what we might be able to do. To reiterate. Um, as far as our general meetings are concerned, we're looking to be able to go back to meeting in person with a hybrid Zoom uh, option uh, in June. Uh, I'll, I'll work some things out there and hopefully next meeting on the 17th, I'll be able to share with you for certain that we're gonna be able to do that. But that's, that's the goal to go back to in-person meetings for those who feel comfortable at that. And I, I wanna say that right now, you know, the, the hybrid meeting that we're talking about is mainly intended to help members of the public uh, participate in the select board meetings as easily as they have for the last year or so. I know Dana and others have indicated, you know, uh, I mean, Dana's been at almost all of your meetings and um, you know it's not because he wasn't interested before but it's not as convenient to have to come here to a meeting when you can be home in your living room or your office wherever wherever you are um, so the the hybrid nature of those meetings is intended to make it more accessible to members of the public to be able to to participate to come and go in a meeting as uh, as freely as they want to, whether they feel like they want to spend the whole meeting or just be on for a topic or two and then and then go off. But if any board members are reluctant to meet in person, uh, certainly you know you can take advantage of of the hybrid meeting and continue to to attend by Zoom. And uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about with my staff, and I'm going to say it now to the to the board members. Since we will have this hybrid um, uh, luxury of meeting from home, you know, if you get sick, and I'm not necessarily talking about COVID, if you have a cold, stay home. Don't give the rest of us the cold. You know, just stay home, participate at home with your box of tissues, and uh, and we'll do the same thing. So, I'm I'm kind of looking forward to the to the hybrid uh, structure. Bill, Bill, kind of aligned with this. I know um, 
at the beginning pre-meeting we discussed about if the uh, town offices are opening do we have a date or we don't yet mike because i know that's been talked about in the state regs and stuff like that well it's been talked about but there's there's been no directive that i know of and uh as i said i've got a staff meeting on thursday this week with the people that work in this building and we'll we'll figure something out I'm sure I'm sure we'll be the first to know some of the first right okay I think we've reached the end of this meeting uh is there anything else that uh, any other sessions um one thing that I would like to uh consider for a future meeting is at least to have a discussion about um the papers that represent uh, our board meetings or write about our board meetings. Um, just have a discussion about, you know, some of the things that are being printed in the paper. Um, some of them, maybe the misunderstandings that are coming out of what's being printed in the paper, which I think is making it a bit more difficult um, as a community to um, stay connected. Uh, in a more friendly fashion, I guess. Um, so if we could put that on a future agenda, just to have a general conversation about it, I'd certainly appreciate it. Okay, and with that- um, Motion to adjourn. Pull the plug, sure. Is there, a second? <laughs> Is there a second? A second. Okay, see you all at the next meeting. Thank you very much for tonight. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.